Greetings and welcome to today's webinar, Development Trends, Building Information Modeling. My name is Liz Vincent and I'm the Membership and Public Policy Manager at CCIM Institute and I would like to introduce Dr. Eric Holt who will be presenting at this webinar today. Dr. Eric Holt is an Assistant Professor in the Burns School of Real Estate and Construction Management at the University of Denver. He teaches construction building systems, architectural planning and design management, and construction estimating. He has 28 years of experience in the construction industry. Eric earned his PhD from Purdue University in construction management. He is a certified instructor for the National Association of Home Builders and teaches a certified green professional, certified aging in place specialist in residential construction superintendent courses. Dr. Holt has published 21 articles in the field of green, building, home, green home building, technology utilized in building information modeling, and incorporating the technology into the classroom setting. During today's webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask questions by using the Q&A feature on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. To ensure enough time is allotted to cover today's content, Dr. Holt will respond to questions at the end of the presentation. Additionally, if you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please use the chat feature. This webinar is being recorded and a recording of today's presentation will be made available to attendees within the next 24 to 48 hours. Eric, please continue with today's presentation and thank you. Thank you, Liz. Appreciate this opportunity. So today we're going to talk about technology in the construction world and the development world, where we're going. Um, uh, as we look at the life cycle of the built environment, uh, this is what we teach here at the University of Denver, but it's what everybody's dealing with every day um, in real estate and project delivery and facilities management or asset management. And <clears throat> our industry has gone through a, a lot of changes uh, over the, the years. Um, we're, we're faulted right now for being one of the most un-moving uh, forward industries out there. So uh, we fall in with uh, agricultural and the investment in technology. Actually, hunting and fishing is moving forward faster than the construction industry has been in the past. And so we're at this verge of this, this new uh, wave of technology, the way it's being utilized in our industry. Uh, a lot of it is being driven by profits. A lot of it is being driven by millennials coming into the industry. There's a lot of factors that are going into this now. Um, so we're going to kind of walk through some of the things at a high level today of, of technology changes you're going to see uh, over the next 10 years and how they're implementing in the design and construction in the real estate industry. One of the, the first ones that we get into is uh, building information modeling. So the models uh, are being developed for or the building, we're going from 2D plans into 3D drawings and then taking that 3D drawing to really implement the planning process. How we look at the drawings, how we organize the sheets, how we can analyze with this information. And, and we take a deeper dive in that in, in a class that we teach here at CCIM. So it allows for a lot of different uh, planning and information being passed back and forth. Different ways that it's utilized. Uh, Eric, can I ask a quick question? Um, I've read that many cities have adopted benchmark marking requirements for a building's energy and water use. How do these new, this new technology, how does it facilitating, facilitate meeting these benchmarking requirements and how do they impact the construction planning process? So it's all about communication. You need to communicate back to the uh, regulators that are requesting this benchmark information and a picture says a thousand words. And so by utilizing uh, BIM and virtual design and construction, uh, it's allowing the construction professional and the real estate professional to document and share out and analyze uh, the requirements for the regulators. And so they can, instead of a, a humongously written verbal uh, response to those requests, now we can give them uh, real-time data, uh, models that show um, in color and in 3D 
what they're looking for in those regulations. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's, that's thank you. So in this virtual design, they're coming with up with all sorts of different ways to um, utilize these, these models. How can we communicate better? So an execution plan is one of the ways they're coming up so they can break the building down into bite-sized chunks of what they're gonna execute you know, today, tomorrow, for the next three weeks, and do a much better step-by-step -step, uh, walkthrough of the construction planning, not just the planning, but then going into the constructability of it, actually putting it together. They can change the level of detail inside these drawings, depending on who the audience is. You know, are we communicating out the big vision to the owner, but then we also need to communicate to the pipe fitter or the sprinkler system guy or the framer physically what he has to do detail-wise. And so we can control that level of detail in the model to be able to communicate out to the right person in the right way. And that really helps in the visualization then of it. Uh, instead of a very, very detailed uh, black line construction drawing set that would layer upon layer of lines that look like a plate of spaghetti that it's hard to interpret and then decipher. Now we can cut and paste and slice and dice and pull out just the information that's needed and show the construction worker, especially right now where, you know, where construction industry and labor uh, skill level is at all time low across the entire nation. So now, to communicate what needs to be done on the project uh, physically on a day-to-day -day basis using these visualization tools help uh, make up for the lower skill level that we're seeing in the job site. And then because we've got all this information and the data in there, all sorts of different analytics can happen uh, both in the planning phase as in what's going to be a better way to build, what's going to be more cost effective to build, but also the analytics and transfers downstream through the construction phase through the operational phase. And then from this model, we can pull our traditional plans and specs that's needed for contract and permit and uh, you know all the wet stamping and the paper system that we're still not anywhere near getting rid of. The constructability of this model allows us then to really look at how the coordination of the building is going to go together. Uh, where in the past, you know, whoever got their first wins when you're installing mechanical systems, which creates a lot of headache and hassles. Uh, now we can actually schedule out and people can come in in more coordinated phases uh, that makes for a better installation of every system in the building. So the, the quality goes up. The coordination between different systems is much higher. Uh, the quantity takeoff is much more accurate because you're pulling from exact what's needed from the model because it's drawn to that level of detail. The software is there now to get down to the exact uh, number of uh, elbows and T's in the plumbing system, the exact embeds in the concrete. And so we get this super quality, uh, high level of detail and accurate quality takeoff, which means we can get also then a super high level of detail in scheduling and planning. And so it allows for much more accurate planning of the whole job site. And then we'll talk about different ways they use different equipment now, and then they can also plan out safety. And, and install things in a more safe and, and workmanship and more of a factory-like manner, even though it's on a job site, open to the uh, uh, air, air and weather and, and everybody uh, to look at it at the same time. It allows us Eric, to build, yes ma'am. I'm sorry, Eric, just a quick, okay. I read a bit that optionality, finding multiple values and uses in a investment can alleviate risk and help maximize returns, especially in more volatile markets. How can these new technologies that you're talking about enhance a developer's ability to plan for multiple user profiles for um, a single project, such as um, the optionality of allowing a multifamily tenant to use their unit as a living space or a workspace? How do these technologies, how can they impact and assist in that? Because you can do the planning for that. You can play the what if game. You can look at different finishes levels that may be needed, different system levels that may be needed. Um, you can actually model in the different usage that is potentially going to happen in that building. And so then you can play the what if game to analyze the risks that are going to come with those different usages. 
So, uh, you know, does that use uh, have a different code uh, book it, it, it's playing under? Both codes are nothing but a rule book. Rules can be written into algorithms and the model can examine or the, the system can examine the model for these specific code changes, use changes, uh, finish level changes, system changes. And so it's giving the design professional, the construction professional, and the real estate professional access to data and playing the what-if game that we've never had before because we've never had the brain power to analyze all of this at once. Um, and now we can actually have, you know, artificial intelligence and the, the 3D model, a lot of these, you know, very powerful software technology run these what-if games and quantify even more the different risks and what's the risk analysis and the risk mitigation that needs to happen. That's fantastic. So within then the model work plans, site logistics, field mobility, these are all things that we can really plan out that, that the construction professional can go to a really high level of detail in working through stuff and, and planning the quality assurance and quality control because you can uh, walk through now the building with augmented reality glasses that are comparing what's actually been physically built back to the original model as the baseline and can instantly red flag places in the plan where we've got issues, changes. Um, the model is so hyper accurate that you can go directly from the model to fabrication. They've got multiple stories now and we get into some real world applications in the full class where they went directly from the model to fabrication out to the field with zero rework. It's just giving a lot of power to the process that we've never had before. The level of automation is going up greatly because again, the model is accurate. We trust the model. And then once the building's built, going through the commissioning process, turning it over to the owner, giving the owner this information so now they can use that in their operations, in their maintenance, in their disaster planning, in their asset management, and their facility management, gives them more power because they know everything about the building. Down to, if you think about a VIN number, for example, of a car, you can pull up the VIN number and you can figure out the exact light bulb you need for your right left tail light. Well, now that's what we're getting to at the level with buildings is knowing every piece and part that goes into that building and everybody that worked on it and when it was installed. And that gives the owner a lot of power in how they move forward in their operations. And all that gives that then information back into big data that can be utilized and analyzed for future usages. Great. Thanks, Eric. And so here's kind of a, we'll try as we try and quantify what we can be doing with this information and coming up with different ways to communicate. But the life cycle of the building is a circular um, ongoing uh, phase. And actually, the, the, the planning, designing, and building of it is just a small part of the life cycle compared to the operation of the building. And all this building has this information that it starts with as a backbone. And so what we're trying to do is capture that information in such a way now that it's actually useful. Where in the past, paper-based systems uh, got uh, antiquated and out of date quickly. Well, now that they're with these uh, software systems and, and data capture systems, they're really allowing us to grab that information, hold on to it, and use it for so much more than just the initial building. And so from that, they're doing some really unique things when it comes to the design phase of the buildings. The analyzation that they can do now, the, to look at energy usage, structural analysis, um, heat flow, uh, how heating and, and cooling is gonna happen where the building sits physically in the uh, Google space Earth, so now we can model you know, not only is the climate zone and the energy usage for the region, but, you know, the other buildings around it uh, affect the climate. You get into a very urban environment, now you create this urban heat sink. And so how does the building not just uh, uh, operate in the normal weather conditions of the climate regions in, but how does it operate in the physical space of the other buildings around it? Uh, we can do light analysis studies. How does light enter the building? How does it bounce around in the building? How does air flow through the building? How does building science come into play inside? 
And then you've got a lot of different ways for owners to control and look at their buildings. And if they've got multiple buildings, multiple campuses, you know, down to, if you can measure it, you can track it, you can analyze it from not just building and how the structure and the HVAC and the energy uses, but also the physical people usages. Where are the meetings being held? Uh, Smithsonian is a great example where they are trying to model every building, 750 plus, that they own across the world and so that they could look and pull up in their system and find out exhibits that are coming online and offline, meeting room spaces that are available. Literally, if someone forgets to turn the lights off from central control, they can take care of that to save energy. There's just all sorts of different things that the owners are looking at that they're doing to try and uh, how do they use this data to operate their buildings. And then that leads us into some automated uh, things that are happening because we have such high accurate models. Now we can take our processes into, you know, robotic level, drone level type construction where before construction was so varied from building to building, crew to crew, that you needed the, the human interaction and the ability to, as they laid up a brick wall, any variances from the plans that had to be dealt with, that's really hard for a computer um, in the past technology to deal with. But for us as humans, we can account for variation in the foundation systems, as an example. And so uh, leading this into, now we've got super hyper accurate models, we can then lead our construction into design and fabrication. Uh, if you've got something, you know, modular is, is extremely uh, becoming uh, mainframe almost or mainline, mainstream in, in some industries. Hotel, um, apartment buildings, multifamily, uh, Marriott uh, is really going to where they're building everything in a modular system. Even though it costs them more per square foot. Uh, they just gave an example here recently where it was like a dollar and a half more per square foot on construction costs, but by building modular, they could bring a hotel online almost a full year earlier than doing traditional methods, and that revenue way offset the extra construction costs for going for a modular system. So um, it's allowing to make some great strides in the technology usage in the construction world. Another thing that, that we're starting to see more and more is this rapid prototype printing, uh, to be able to visualize, work through parts and pieces of a building. Um, it's still for like printing an entire full size structure, I believe, is still a ways away. There's a lot of great YouTube videos that show um, 3D printing on a house level, uh, and I love watching those. The challenge I have with those, if you watch those videos, you, you'll see there's not any outlets that meet building code, uh, plumbing walls, things like that. And when I do the, the reverse search on those, a lot of those 3D printing are outside of uh, North America where we have a lot more regulated building codes. And, and so as soon as they can start figuring out how they build in, you know, some of the building codes, basic building codes like outlet location, switches, things like that, we'll see that come uh, a little more into fruition for doing full size full scale printing, but it's still a ways out, but it's still coming because, you know, doing, uh, building models to, to visualize things for clients, if you're not 3D printing it, rapid prototype printing, then that's a really expensive and time consuming piece uh, of architecture. Uh, so now that's, this part is speeding that up in the visualization and design side. Eric, I noted um, in a recent Urban Land Institute report, they, stated that small and mid-sized developers will have an increasingly significant role in the industry. Do new technologies such as 3D, rapid, 3D printing and rapid prototype printing especially benefit smaller developers by keeping costs down and facilitating um, design processes? Definitely the design side, because design is moving faster and faster now, because uh, market cycles, uh, you know, that the push for the design professional get their plans out quicker uh, so we can go get permits because permitting takes so much longer, um, those type of things. So it's helping the design side go faster, um, helping the, the owner visualize and make decisions quicker. So, and because 
it used to be really expensive to go to a rapid prototype printing setup, but now you can go to Costco's and buy one for less than a thousand bucks. So uh, if they're using it for visualization, then I would say yes. Um, some of the pictures you see here on the slide are showing some much larger architecture trying to work through things. Um, so from the smaller to mid-sized developer, it's, it's how do they utilize it? A lot of times they're utilizing it to speed up the design process, the visualization, so you can get plans, so you can get permits faster, so you can get into the ground faster. So that's my experience, but I'm very much more on the construction side than on the developer side. Thanks, Eric. And then all this great technology is really cool and awesome, especially from sitting in my academic bubble, but the reality is we've got to get it into the field. If the workers that are installing this uh, information, physically laying the brick, the pipe, the concrete, aren't utilizing this technology, then everything that we're doing looks great in an office, but it's not moving the industry forward. Well, there's great strides now in field mobility. Uh, besides a, a plethora of apps, the, the usage of uh, tablets, rugged tablets, iPads on the job site, uh, as you see here, uh, HP has come up with all sorts of different field boxes, uh, the field mobility of internet, um, and having Wi-Fi on a job site early is incredibly important, um, being linked up to the cloud through all this. Uh, and then these, these boxes, you know, they've got uh, high volume, uh, wide format printing, so you can print off a picture or a plan set that you're currently working on and walk over to your job site and install it. Some way to communicate to the the field worker what he's doing. Uh, also, things being communicated out to their phones now via text messages and links to details. Having big 3D monitors that literally can roll around on the job site to exactly where the guys are working, so they can pull dimensions and information to to accurately assemble the building, just like the model. And so we're making great strides here in the mobility of the field and getting that information into the work chance. Eric, can um, this field mobility, can it assist with some of discussed projected labor shortages in the construction sector? Can field mobility allow for construction managers to be more than one place at what time? And can this technology partially alleviate some of these labor shortage issues? That's exactly what it's doing because you're you're working with a, a less skilled labor force than ever before. Um, younger generation, um, fewer of them, and so you've got to make them as efficient as possible. Trying to reduce anything that has to be reworked because anytime you're reworking something due to either quality errors or install installation wrong errors, that's just lost money and time, and it's costing the job site dearly and it's costing morale. And so by leveraging this technology, the, the industry right now is looking at how, to, how do we fix this labor issue? And there's two school of thought. One, we just train more people, pay people better, and bring more people into the industry. And the second is how do we leverage technology to make those people more efficient, uh, better workers, uh, train them quicker. And so by using the field mobility that you're you're bringing the information directly into the hands of those that are installing the, the, the systems in the building. And so if they can be much more efficient at their job, uh, you're going to get higher quality, you're going to get it done faster because everybody's pushing faster. And so, um, you know, the leveraging of this technology, if it's being used and leveraged all the way down to the field worker, can, can uh, help alleviate that lack of labor force right now, or unskilled labor force. That's fantastic. So if anybody's got an iPhone or uh, an Android out there and the plethora of apps that are out availability for any type of service, any type of uh, industry, the construction industry is keeping up with it like crazy. There's just tons of stuff coming online, different software packages, different apps. Seems like there's an app for everything, So, uh, which is a lot of fun if you're big into technology, but I get some pushback from you know, builders, it also gets overwhelming too, you know, how do you get all your people on a, uh, working the same direction at the same time with the same technology has now become a challenge in the industry. 
And then, you know, we, we talk about the, the new generation of workers and how the millennial generation that's coming into the workforce now, you know, what are they looking for? How are they technology savvy? What technology do they utilize? How do they operate? Uh, some of it's very, very good. And I get the, the pleasure of teaching and working with this generation of students. Some of it is, you know, we hear challenges from the industry because they don't know how to use punctuation. They only know how to communicate in 128 characters. Um, they, they don't know how to make a phone call. Um, and so the, the, the pros and cons of the technology coming out with the generation, uh, it's exciting to see someone, especially at an older generation like me, it's also a headache too. So um, utilizing the technology and helping with the new incoming workers is something that uh, our industry is going to be challenged with and working through. And then everybody loves, you know, big data. And that's like a huge buzzword right now in all sorts of industries. Uh, and construction is one of them. How do we leverage all this information we're creating? You know, we're, we're creating all these million data points as we scan a building. Uh, and so that becomes, what do we do with all this information? How do we process it? Um, how do we store it? How do we analyze it? Um, what are we doing with it? The cloud is made for a a uh, huge transformation and, and collection and storage of this information and uh, the different web services that are out there now. And so then a lot of companies are looking at how do we drive our profit with all these different analytics? How do we find the, the, the nuggets now in this data that can uh, change the way that we build, the way that we operate, uh, the way that we utilize this information? So um, there's a lot of good stuff to cover and, and uh, I think you see that I'm running out of time here, but um, just want to say that there is a lot of neat things coming on the horizon, and we have the opportunity to talk deeper on it uh, through uh, an upcoming class. Is this a good time for Q&A? Yeah. Um, Eric, thank you so, so much um, for all this fantastic information. Um, Thank you for joining us for this webinar today to everyone, and thank you to Derek, for Dr. Eric Holt for this great information. If you found this information useful, uh, you can sign up for Dr. Holt's 90-minute course, Instruction, Building Intro Introduction to Building Information Modeling, with two times a year, with the next scheduled date on Monday, March 9th from 12 to 1.30 p.m. Central. You can register for this course at the URL on your screen, www.ccim.com forward slash ward. Um, and thank you again to Dr. Eric Holt for uh, this fantastic presentation today. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. So are there any, I, I see at least one question in the chat. Can I go ahead and check with that? Go right ahead, I'm sorry. That's okay. So, so Walt asks, what's the additional cost to utilize uh, a BIM system? Uh, do you need a large project to make this cost effective? Um, the, the costs of a BIM are very project specific. Um, I, I, I've seen, you know, anywhere from a couple grand to a hundred thousand plus. So it, it depends on the system, what you're using for. Is it just a 3D model? Is it uh, other technologies and how you're leveraging them? And so that's hard to answer. What's the additional cost of utilizing a BIM system because of there's so many ways you can do it. So a lot of times, you know, do you need a large project to make this cost effective? That answer, I, I say no because you can look at the project and you're going to make a list of what questions do we want to answer on that project that potentially building information modeling, virtual design could answer. And then you, you, you've got to come up with you know, a value proposition. You know, The answer to this question is going to cost you X amount of dollars. Is that worth it? Do you need it or not? And those are the decisions economically that every project and every project team gets to go through because you could spend a lot of money but not get information back that's of value. And you could spend a little money and get a lot of information that is of great value. So uh, every project uh, has to go through this, what's the right word for it? Coming up with a BIM execution plan is exactly what are the goals, what are the outcomes that we need, and what's the value of that? Does that help, Walt? Eric, I've got one more question for you. Sure. Where do we 
go to get bids to implement a BMI in a new development project? So it initially starts out with your design team. Um, if your design team is not working in that space yet, but it's something you still want to find out, then the next step a lot of times is your construction team. Uh, there are a lot of construction firms out there. But that's who's really leading this market and this change in technology. It's not the architects. It's not the design professionals. It's the construction world that's leading it because they're tired of the inefficiencies and they're tired of slogging through the mud and the rework and the lost money and time. And so a lot of places, it starts with your construction team and what are their capacity and, and capabilities in this new technology. That's who's leading the charge for a lot of uh, projects. You're finding more and more architects coming along and getting with the system, but they're not unfortunately leading it. So starting with your, your design team, your construction team, uh, you yourself as an owner being informed with the technologies that are out there, so asking the right questions. And that's what I hope that you take away from the course that we teach on March 9th is to give you a better idea of, of what are the right questions to ask, how to speak the language, what are the terminology, those are some of the things that we cover along with real world um, examples of how it's being utilized in past projects so that you know how to speak intelligently and effectively about it. Eric, I've got one more question. Um, is this effective for redevelopment projects as well? Yes, uh, it's as effective as the accuracy of the information that you're inputting in, meaning that you've got an existing building. How do you get that existing data of the building, its structure, its size? And they have laser scanning technology where they can go in um, pretty cost effectively now and digitize and scan your existing building. And that's some of the things I touch on in that class to show you, especially if you're going from old construction and existing to brand new, uh, it, it, how do you interface those systems together, especially MEP systems? And it is done now very, very well to go in for a redevelopment project, to look at an existing building, get data point scans of all the existing structure systems, um, and then interface with the new uh, design and the new model to make sure it's a seamless uh, redevelopment. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, thank you again for uh, this fantastic mini webinar today. Um, and thanks to all who, who joined us.